Back in 2010, Steve Eisenman would be recruited as GM of the Tampa Bay Lightning. And in the next nine years, Stevie Y would build Tampa into a modern day dynasty. People get mad at me for saying that, but three finals in a row is unprecedented in the modern era. But before lifting a Stanley Cup in Tampa, the Red Wings would part ways with GM Ken Holland, where Eisenman would leave Tampa, make a return to Motown. The balls of steel to leave a championship caliber roster just to go back to your hometown team is crazy. And after taking over the Red Wings in the 2019 offseason, that next year, the Red Wings would have the worst season from a non-expansion team in NHL history as they would finish the season with a horrendous 17-49-5 record. So now that we're in year 4 of the Iser plan and the Red Wings have yet to make the playoffs under Iserman, it begs the question, was Iserman's success in Tampa a fluke? Perhaps stolen valor? Is the Iser plan working? Or has it been a massive failure? Because in the past several months, I've seen countless fans questioning what Eisman is building in Motown. And in this video, we are going to find answers. Back in the dead puck era, when NHL scoring was at an all-time low due to defensive structures and goaltending, NHL teams led by Patrick Waugh, Martin Brodeur, Dominic Hasek would cause NHL teams to scramble to find their elite starter, which would lead to an ungodly amount of goalies being drafted first overall or at the high end of the draft. Roberto Luongo, Rick DiPietro, Marc-Andre Fleury, maybe Kari Lettinen. And for some perspective, during the high-flying offensive era, leading up to the dead puck era, from 1984 until 1996, so a 13 year time frame, only 3 goalies were drafted in the top 10. Whereas, from 1997 until 2005, so a 9 year time frame, there was 10 goalies drafted in the top 10. And from 2005 until today, so the last 18 years, there has been zero. The dead puck era, therefore the goaltending renaissance, would cause teams to panic to find their franchise starter. However, it would soon become clear that this strategy was way too risky. But this contrast emphasizes how championship formulas can have an immense ripple effect. The late 2000s, championship runs led by center duos like Datsuk and Zetterberg, Crosby and Malkin, or perhaps the dominance we would see from a center core of Kobotar, Carter, and Mike Richards, NHL teams would begin to put a high bounty on centers. And just like goaltending, we would see an exponential increase in the amount of centers taken at the high end of the draft. Because from the year 2000 until 2007, which is right around the time before the center renaissance, we would see 23 centers drafted within the top 10. Whereas, in the last 8 drafts, we have seen 37 centers drafted in the top 10. It's not that teams didn't think goaltending or center depth wasn't crucial for a contending team. We saw these dramatic changes due to lessons learned from past champions. And at this point, you may be thinking, Rob, what the hell does this have to do with Stevie Y in the Iser plan? In the past several years, we have seen the consequences of rushing a rebuild. When we saw the emergence of Elias Pettersson in Vancouver, we would see the Canucks look to the trade block in free agency to quickly build a team around Pettersson and Hughes. This was a shortcut. The same thing can be said about when Buffalo drafted Jack Eichel, as they knew they had their franchise player, as they would make a slew of trades and signings in an attempt to expedite the rebuild process. And as we know today, this strategy would ultimately blow up in each team's face, which ironically, at the end of the day, it ended up being counterintuitive because rushing the rebuild only delays the rebuild. So add in a stagnant salary cap and the introduction of two expansion teams, which has depleted depth around the league. Rushing a rebuild is a recipe for disaster and is only emphasized that drafting is the key to constructing a contending roster. And back in 2020, Yoki Nevalainen from Dauber Prospects would conduct a draft analysis to determine what percentage of players by round will play 100 games in the NHL. First round picks are sitting at 74%, for second round picks we have 34%, third round picks 27%, and weirdly enough, the sixth round has had a better success rate than the fifth round and since Eisenman took the reins back in 2019. The message has been clear. Draft your way to success. Screw trading high-end draft picks for NHL players who cost too much and may not even be a good fit. Draft and develop your way to a cup. 
Eisenman has done exactly that. In fact, it has been astonishing. When Buffalo drafted their franchise center in Jack Eichel, they would proceed to make 15 picks within the first three rounds in the following five years. After the Canucks would draft Elias Pettersson, the Vancouver Canucks would make nine, only nine selections in the top three rounds in the following five years. And since taking over the team back in 2019, Steve Eiserman has drafted 25 players. In this previous stacked 2023 draft, Eiserman had two first round picks, an insanely high four picks in the second round, which is especially crazy when you consider that second round picks this past draft had the value of a late first compared to past drafts, as he would end up with seven picks in the first three rounds. Eisenman nearly had more draft selections in 2023 than the Vancouver Canucks had in the following five years. But at the end of the day, drafting is a gamble. There's a reality where highly sought upon prospects just don't develop. But if you watched my last video covering Eisenman, you would know that he has one of the best drafting track records in NHL history. The league average for the odds of drafting a 20 goal scorer from the second to seventh round is 4%. Whereas, Eisenman back in Tampa would average an astounding 10% if one in 10 players outside the first round end up being a significant goal scorer. The draft just becomes an odds game. A game Eisenman is clearly playing. And from the last five cup runs, we have seen that a championship caliber team needs the following. One, a true number one defenseman. A Ritz Sider, a six foot six Simon Edmondson, who keep in mind is looking like the reincarnation of Victor Hedman, alongside of newly drafted Axel Sandin Pelika, who is currently lighting up the SHL as an 18 year old, points toward the fact that Detroit could have a top blue line in the next five years. Two, center depth. Aside from Dylan Larkin, the Red Wings are lacking up the middle. Now they do have some guys with some room to grow, but Detroit's center depth going forward is dependent on the development of Marco Casper, who was selected eighth overall in 2022, and Nate Danielson, who I'm very high on. If these guys can turn into players, the Red Wings have the upside of a center core reminiscent to the Vegas Golden Knights, as in four lines who can match up against any line. Three, competent goalie duo. Now funny enough, from what we learned from Colorado and Vegas, a team doesn't need an elite starter. Defensive structures can compensate, but it does definitely help to have that upper echelon guy in net. In 2021, Eisenman drafted a 6'6 Kosa, a pick 15. And although a small sample size, his showing this year has been great, as he has the athleticism and size to be something special. And as of right now, their winger depth is nothing spectacular. And it's definitely why Eisman went out and acquired Alex Debrinkit. But if there's any position you want to be weak in, it is wingers, as they are the easiest position to acquire through free agency and trades. I think it's also important to emphasize the importance of a guy like David Perron. When he signed, I saw a lot of people critiquing the move. But as we have seen from previous rebuild failures, Yes, it's crucial to have ample space on the roster to allow young players to have more ice time. But without veterans, you are left with a team without an identity. Thus, you need to find that balance. The acquisition of Perron, Cop, Jeff Petrie is exactly that. So all in all, Eisenman has built an extremely impressive core heading into the future. Especially when you consider Eisenman's drafting track record. If he even has, you know, two to four guys drafted in the later rounds to develop into stars, this team has serious championship upside. Cause I've seen many fans questioning, if not crapping, on the Iser plan. But here's the thing, pressure from a fan base can cause not the GM to rush a rebuild. No, it can ultimately pressure ownership, as they are the ones who are losing money out of their pockets. But with that, there is no doubt in my mind that Eisenman took this job as he knew there would be no pressure or persuasion make moves he didn't agree with. So let's be patient, as I truly believe that Eisenman is thinking long term. Focus on building something from the ground up. But what are your thoughts on the Eiser plan? Comment down below. The guaranteed Connor McDavid pack is still in stock, or you're chasing rookies, autos, and a bunch of other good stuff? Check it out down below. And as always, thanks for watching.